Okay, so uh, our next speaker is Professor Matthias Nieser. Uh, Matthias is a professor at the TUM where he leads the Visual Computing Lab. Before, he was a visiting assistant professor at Stanford University. Professor Matthias, uh, Matthias uh, research lines at the intersection of computer vision, oh, uh, computer vision, graphics, and machine learning, where he is particularly interested in cutting edge techniques for 3D reconstruction, semantic 3D scene understanding, video editing, and AI-driven video synthesis. His team developed Face to Face, which was the first work to manipulate facial expression from cons consumer camera in real time. Uh, Professor Matthias, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, and it's a real pleasure to kind of be at least virtually back to CVPR. It's, um, it's very good to have some engaging conversations with all of the community again. Um, it's been a while. So I hope next year we can, of course, do it in person. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk in this, in this talk about deep fakes and the generation and the detection. And I, I want to kind of combine like this talk in both, ex, in both angles, right? Like what is the challenge? Like first, how do, how do generations of deep fakes and generally facial editing videos work? And then also like, what are the weaknesses? How can we detect it? How can we exploit weaknesses and so on? So of course, deep fakes is a very popular term, right? A lot of people um, have been talking about it. It's been in a sense a bit blown up also in the media. Um, there's been one original deep fake method, which was a method to do um, facial replacement. And the method is based on an autoencoder technique where you basically train an encoder and then you replace the decoder respectively. And then you um, kind of get this as an input and then you get a, a replacement on the face. Um, and it's a thing that was, was published on GitHub actually. It wasn't actually really published at a conference. Um, and, and this kind of gave um, the, this deep fake terminology um, the name and it also was applied now not only to face swapping, which was, was, was done here, but it was also applied to all kinds of facial editing. And this is kind of what the media um, and even the scientific community, many people are associating with deep fakes right now. Um, and you can see probably in this kind of um, short video that it doesn't look that great yet. This was one of the first learning based methods for face swapping. Um, but since then, of, of course, many, many other methods have been developed for both um, various facial editing methods. Okay, um, one big thing I always do when I give these deepfake talks, I wanted to clarify there's two different things actually when we're talking about facial editing. Um, one of them is face swapping and one of them is facial reenactment. And these are fundamentally different things, both from an application, but also from um, a methodology side. So when we're talking about um, face swapping, the idea is we're having essentially one video, we're having a second video and we're trying to take the face of the second video and copy pasting it on the first one. And you often see that in this case, well, this face is post, uh, pasted on this one here. Like this target video here doesn't look like it's, it's altered too much. So um, it, it looks a bit strange. Sometimes it also looks a little bit like a, a filtered version of it. Um, but, but often the, the early deep fake methods, they didn't really do the face swapping that well in a sense that, you know, it looks, looks fairly realistic. And one thing I also wanted to highlight when we're doing face swapping, by definition, this output video here, um, it's not a real video, of course, but it's, it's also, by definition, it can't be real because it creates a hybrid between a background and a foreground video, right? So the background is still from the original one, the hair is from the original video, and the foreground is from a new video. So um, I mean, whenever you're reading about deep fakes, so be very careful that most of the time when people talk about face swapping, um, it's not that big of a deal, right? Like, because the output is kind of this hybrid. Um, however, when we're talking about facial reenactment, the scenario changes slightly. Um, in this case, we're having a, a video here, we're having another video and we're having a different expression here um, where we want to take the expressions from this target, uh, from the source video and then we want to animate the, 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 the target video, right? And in this case, actually, that is a bit, what, what I think is a bit of a more um, quote unquote interesting area, right? Because now we actually taking an existing video, we are editing and altering the expressions and it, it kind of looks like if that person um, was saying or was doing something different. And it still looks exactly like that person. So um, often when I'm presenting research, I'm mostly talking about facial reenactment because I think this is, um, it has a lot more applications, both both good and, and both bad, of course, right? So we have, to, we have to carefully think about that. 
but most of the time I'm talking about facial enactment. Um, also, um, like, you know, facial editing is not a new thing with deep learning. This is a thing that has been around actually in the graphics community, specifically in the movie industry for, for decades, right? Um, so if you're thinking about um, movie productions where you have stunt doubles and you wanna, wanna edit the face. So here you have the Star Wars, um, it's a very famous movie, of course, where the actor's face has been virtually replaced. Um, and this is just one example, but, but this is a thing that has been around for decades, basically. And of course, nowadays we have, um, we have um, deep learning models, we have adversarial neural networks, we have GANs, we have all kinds of autoregressive networks um, Then it can actually do um, editing. And I wanted to talk a, a little bit about the editing first, and then I want to talk about what we can do for detection. So when we talk about facial editing in the graphics context, it's actually mostly a relatively straightforward pipeline um, on a high level. And on a high level, what, what people are doing, they're going ahead and doing first a facial construction. So you have you have an input um, image or video here. You, you have a, a, face, a face model here. You're trying to have an energy where you're optimizing for face parameters P. Uh, and these face parameters P kind of control the shape and the appearance of this face model. And, and the idea is we want to minimize this energy such that every pixel here uh, of this face model, when we're rendering it, um, matches with whatever we're seeing in the input. So this is our objective function. Um, and as I said, it sounds very easy on a high level, like doing face reconstruction, but it's actually, it's pretty tricky because you have this photometric term you need to minimize um, and you have a 3D to 2D correspondence problem that you kind of need to solve. Uh, this is one of the things we've done in this face-to-face -face paper. Um, there have been a lot of other um, face reconstruction methods, of course, but I, I think arguably um, what Justus Tis has done here in this work um, is actually, it's probably still considered to be state of the art for getting very, very accurate face reconstructions. Um, and, and once you do this very well, you can even do this in real time, you're getting reconstructions that look like these. So here we see the input video, here we see the reconstructed geometry, and here we see, we see the reconstructed geometry plus the respective um, colors matched on top of it, right? So ideally every pixel here matches with every pixel here on the face. Um, yeah, so now what we're seeing is um, we have a good a well reconstructed face. And what we can do now is we can actually take this face that we here reconstruct and can re-render it on top of the input video. And this is actually a synthetically rendered video here, what you see. Um, and in this video, um, yeah, the face part is re-rendered. And you can already guess, like if the reconstruction is pretty good, and this is a pretty good reconstruction here, then this video and that video is, is in a sense indistinguishable from each other. Well, and this, this kind of allows this, this, this idea of facial expression. So now what we can do is we can kind of take two people, we reconstruct both of their faces, uh, we take the expression parameters from one face and we're re-changing um, or re-rendering the face of the other person, right? Um, and if we're doing this, this is kind of what this face-to-face -face method is doing, right? So here we have a source actor um, that is replacing here the facial expressions of the target actor. Um, there's a couple of image-based techniques to make it look good. Um, the tracking is optimized on the, uh, the tracking reconstruction is optimized on the GPU. But on a, on a very high level, the idea is relatively simple, right? We, we're reconstructing a high quality face model. We're using that face model, we're editing it, uh, we're re-rendering it on top of the face. And this is how kind of traditional graphics-based facial editing is done. And you can do this not only for the face, you can do this also for the whole body. Um, here's another um, project we had um, two, uh, three years ago. Actually, already now it's, um, it's this head-on project, right? So here we have the whole reconstruction of the upper body, and we can then reenact also kind of this rigid motion and, and so on, everything, right? Okay, so this is kind of what graphics methods are doing, and there's various variations of that. But now I want to talk a little bit about what deep learning-based methods are doing. Um, and this is not to be confused. These graphics-based methods I've shown you before, they also use machine learning techniques, like the face model is a statistical face model um, that's based on a PCA, so this is also learned. Um, so there's, in the graphics methods, there's still a lot of learning going on. Uh, but now the question is, how do we do these kind of things with deep learning? And of course, many of you, probably all of you in this workshop, they know, of course, what um, generative neural networks are. Um, so if you're talking about generative networks, the idea is we have um, a very, very big powerful network. Um, we over-parameterize like this problem statement by having a lot of parameters. And if you have enough parameters, you can kind of recreate the input. Um, and then we have various loss functions, right? For instance, the, um, in, in the GAN setting, we have a discriminator loss. Um, and now we're trying to, in a sense, um, 
learn this distribution of the input images, right? Um, and, and the naive GAN formulation um, by Goodfellow, right? What, what this one is doing is it, it's literally learning this distribution. It's very, it's very challenging, of course, to tweak all the hyperparameters, but if you're doing a good job with hyperparameter tuning, you can kind of learn this distribution of facial images and so on. Uh, one of the downsides of the GAN formulations is they 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 ex they, they don't give you really explicit control, right? Like you you you, you have a, a latent variable z. From this variable z, you can generate or can sample your distribution, but you, it's very difficult to control it if you do this naively. Um, and the second thing is you you struggle with videos, right? For images, GANs have made a lot of progress in the past um, few years, but for for videos, it's you know it's it's not that easy yet. Um, but for images, we have we have seen a lot of great works. Um, there's of course the progressive growing GAN paper, the ProGAN paper from uh, Karas et al. It uses like this incrementally growing network architecture to produce high resolution images, and then of course the follow up works from um, from the same group where they do style GAN, um, and they produce actually quite phenomenal results. So here are some of these results that people get um, in the style GAN setting. Um, so it's very very high quality outputs. Um, and you have kind of you have a little bit of control now with these coarse, middle, and fine styles, um, but it's still not creating any videos, right? And, the, and you, the control is very limited in a sense that you can kind of control style images, but you can't really create like a fully animated avatar, which would which would be nice from a let's say content creation per, uh, perspective. Um, so one way to make these kind of things a little bit more applicable in practical scenarios. Um, is to condition the GANs. And this is what conditional GANs are doing. Um, so one of the examples um, from the uh, Max Planck Institute in collaboration with us was the, the deep video portraits paper where the idea is here, um, we are essentially taking a video, we are reconstructing a face model, and then we're training a, a conditional GAN that is conditioned on these synthetic renderings and the GAN just learns to make synthetic renderings look realistic again. So it's kind of combining now the advantages of graphics-based techniques, what we have seen before, where you reconstruct the phase model um, with a learning-based technique um, that makes the synthetically reconstructed phase model look like an image of the video. Again. And the idea here is that this GAN here at the end, this conditional GAN is trained specifically only on one single video. And if this is trained only on one video, this can learns to you know, create realistic images from this one video, which is a lot easier actually to do than to generate any arbitrary videos. And it's actually quite fast to train. It takes maybe hours to train, but not, not like days or even weeks. Um, now, since we have this control here over an explicit 3D model that is being used as conditioning for the GAN part here, uh, we have full control, right? So you can take another source video here, can also do a reconstruction here. And then you can edit these kind of things um, by replacing certain face parameters. You can now create new real renderings. And with these new real renderings, uh, you essentially give the GAN different conditions. And since the GAN is trained on the specific video, it will make them look realistic as samples from this video. Um, and in practice, it looks like that. Um, so you've got a source sequence here. Uh, you've got a target sequence. This is actually a 3D reconstruction of her, right? Um, and this is now a condition to uh, a conditional GAN. And then the scan makes these synthetic renderings look like real images again. So the neural network converts the synthetic data into a realistic video. Um, and yeah, these synthetic renderings we can animate with a source track face, for instance. And then we can um, kind of control the output video this way, right? So now we're co combining kind of these advantages of graphics based methods with deep learning based methods. Um, and it allows essentially GANs to have control um, in the respective target sequences. So here's another example here, right? Um, yeah, so this is, this is kind of cool, produces good results, and you can do all kind of editing things. Yeah, so one of the challenges though is um, the, these, these, these methods, including ours here, of course, um, they're mostly trained on, on 2D conditional GANs. And by 2D conditional GANs, I mean, um, these methods have a series of 2D convolutions and they're conditioned on 2D images, on a sequence of 2D images. Um, but they don't have any 3D operators, which makes actually videos still very challenging. And this is an example here when we're training a conditional GAN, here we're training picks to picks um, to, to re-render novel viewpoints of this cube. And this is a super difficult example. This cube is like spinning in 3D, right? It has a, a very high frequency texture text on it. 
Um, and if you're training it based on the current viewpoints, you're gonna get actually these like swimming artifacts. And it's kind of obvious, it's a challenging example because you're gonna have to, to make sure this 2D GAN has to learn all the 3D rotation operations, right? So this is challenging. Um, and one solution towards that is actually um, done in the work by Vincent Sitzmann, um, this the voxels work, where we're lifting the 2D features. So the argument we're having here is instead of running just 2D operations, we're lifting the features to 3D and applying 3D operators directly um, in the feature space. And if you're training on the very same amount of training data in the same complexity, roughly in terms of number of parameters in the model, you're gonna get significantly better results of, them, of the output here, right? Um, and this is kind of a general thing that is happening in deep learning right now is like, instead of learning everything with like a black box 2D function, like a convolution, um, you're getting more and more, um, yeah, possibly differentiable parts into the network that you don't have to learn things that you know. In this case, we know how a rotation works, right? We know how a rotation matrix is being applied to a set of features and we can differentiate through it. And because of that, we, we save a lot of capacity and training capacity as well. Now we did this with voxels here, um, as, as many of you guys might know, right? Like voxels, they grow cubically, of course. Um, it's not so memory efficient. So scaling this beyond a single object is, is, is not that easy. Um, so one of the follow-ups works we have been doing is this neural texture work. So instead of lifting the features to a voxel space, we're now lifting the features to mesh space. Um, and then the features live on some sort of 3D geometry. Um, that is a proxy and it has a texture space. And instead of having RGB textile values, we're having now neural texture values. And the idea is similar to the voxels, what I've shown you before. Uh, now you can go ahead and, and take this proxy model. You can render it to a target viewpoint. You can sample from this texture and you have a unit render that makes a realistic image out of it. So on a high level, what's happening here is we're saying, well, we can reconstruct some geometry, which is that one that serves us as a proxy it's, it's very imperfect, this geometry, because you know the texture here looks not very good. But now we can learn appearance on a per surface point in form of these neural pixels that we can then project into a target view with a non-projection function. And then we have this renderer that makes a realistic image out of it, right? So it's like a conditional GAN, except that we have a 3D latent variable in form of this 3D model in it. So we can basically learn um, we, we don't have to learn like these, these like projections and so on, right? So we have them already. Um, so this is a, a thing that we can do for novel scene synthesis. We can do for all kinds of applications, um, but we can also do it for facial reenactment. Um, and this is something we have been doing here. So here we're having a, a video of Obama and what we're doing is we're reconstructing his face. So this is the, the, the face part of Obama. We're having a UV map of the face part. We're learning the neural textures uh, for this UV part here. Uh, and then we are learning to resynthesize Obama frames from the neural network with the re-rendering of the neural pixels, right? Um, and, and this one works actually quite well um, because now this pipeline can be trained end-to-end -end and it can be completely animated by a source video. And what you see here on the right-hand side is, is an animation of this, right? So this is a completely synthetic synthesized video. Okay, so um, I'm not sure if you heard the audio. It's not so important, but I guess the, the conclusion here is like for this face part here, we are essentially using these neural pixels. Um, they're, uh, they're a combination of a graphics method where we have neural pixels on top of the mesh and then we're re rendering on top of the respective target. And this works quite well. Um, because you know you, you have this latent three variable as form of the mesh, and this is nice. Um, and we've been working and continuing working on this problem a little bit more, where we, we wanted to 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 combine these explicit three D representations such that the network doesn't have to learn them anymore, which you know saves a lot of training data and gives just better results. And one of the very recent papers, this is actually a CDPR oral from this year, um, is uh, from Guy Gaffney. He's a, he's an, uh, actually he's a first year PhD student in my group. Um, so this is his first work. And what he's been doing, he's been working on um, combining the, the, nerf, uh, the nerf approaches with dynamic renderings of faces. And the idea here is you also have a monocular sequence here and you wanna learn this kind of um, uh, radiance field. So we have this radiance field representation like in nerf and then you have a volumetric renderer that can go ahead and um, 
you can render novel poses from the person and you also want to be able um, to animate the expressions right so we want to get kind of this uh, 4d avatar where we can do novel poses as well as novel expressions at the same time okay um yeah so how does this help in terms of editing well the idea here what we've been doing um creates this 4d avatar right again we can combine these kind of things now we can uh Let's show this again. So we can go ahead and can animate, rotate, and have kind of full control of that person's face. Um, so in a sense, it's novel viewpoint synthesis plus um, reanimations of the same person. And then you can also do retargeting in the same way we've done it before um, with all kind of facial editing methods. You can take um, a source video and you can use that in order to animate the target video respectively, which you can see here. So let me. Show another example here. Again, this is a source video that is animating the respective target. So I don't want to go into all the technical details here, um, but I think this is probably you know one of the state of the art uh, papers right now that you can use to take a video. You reconstruct this avatar, and you can create photorealistic re-renderings as well as reanimations um, from that video, and that produces kind of very very realistic outputs um, that you know, in a, on a very high level fault, this kind of deep fake family because we can edit um, videos that we have. Now, I've talked a lot about the state of the art that, um, you know, we and other groups have been working for video and facial editing. Um, so now what about the detection side, right? So when I, I want to quickly talk a little bit about that one. And in principle, you know, since, since we, we all know how neural networks work, in principle, the discriminative networks, you know, detection is the discriminative task. We either want to know is it real or is it fake? Um, that in principle is an easier task, right? So you, you can go in the classical sense, you, you, you can collect a bunch of data, train a classifier, it's a binary cross entropy loss, right? It says real versus fake. If you have enough labels, eventually you hope to learn these kind of things. Um, and this is actually what we have done, right? This is something we have been doing in the space forensics works. We've collected actually a bunch of data. Uh, in this case, we not just collected it, we created it because we had the fake methods at hand. Um, and um, we, we then had all kinds of various manipulations, and then we trained classifiers to detect it. So in comparison to, to other works that have appeared at the same time, like the, the idea of the space forensics data set is actually that it doesn't have only a single method, but instead it has deep fakes, face-to-face, face swapping, and neural textures. And um, in total, we have about um, over yeah, two, two, two and a half million frames. Um, of manipulated uh, videos and and we published all of this data online and a lot of people have actually already used it um, in order to train the respective classifiers right we also made sure we had a reasonable diversity in terms of gender in terms of resolution and also in terms of pixel coverage um, for how many pixels the face covered um, uh, yeah i think these numbers are a little bit outdated i think we've probably over 5,000 groups or so now that have used this data set um, it's a relatively popular data set in this in this area um, because a lot of people actually um, are working on on these problems because it's very relevant uh, in addition to the to the data set itself we also have a benchmark um, again these numbers are a little bit outdated um, actually the the benchmark numbers are a lot better right now than 0.7 they actually owe 0.9 already um, so people have gotten pretty good results on detection um, by by using this kind of data and you know this is done in this uh, public benchmark now in principle, this sounds all pretty easy, right? Because um, you, you can just generate uh, like some fake data, right? You, you collect a lot of this fake data and you then use that data to train a classifier. And if you have enough data, which I believe we have right now, we can have very reliable decisions whether things are real or whether they are fake, right? Um, so now this sounds all good in principle, um, as long as you're in an academic setting, you have a data set, you try to beat numbers in the data set, but as soon as you go to the real world, things become a lot, lot more problematic. And the simple why things <laughs> become a lot more problematic is um, as soon as anything changes in the distribution of your test data, um, things don't work so well anymore. In fact, the better you're doing on the test data set um, and the bigger you make your model, right, the more overfitting to the respective data sets features. That's a very common thing, of course. Um, and this is very challenging, specifically in that context of fake detection. So there's, there's a lot of major challenges like self-supervised learning, transfer learning, unsupervised learning. But I wanted to highlight how bad these, uh, the generalizability is actually right now. So if you are training an exception net model, it's a pretty big model, of course, 
if you're training this on, let's say, face-to-face -face, and you're testing on face-to-face, -face, you're getting 90% accuracy. So it's basically solved, right? So it's, it's a um, very high accuracy. But then when you're testing on face swap, you see that the generalizability between these two methods is, is zero, right? There's like no generalizability because face swap data statistics are very different from face-to-face -face data statistics. And the same way comes the other way around. If you only train on face swap videos, you've been very good on face swap, but very bad on face-to-face. -face. Now, the first thing we tried, we thought, well, you know, <laughs> um, we just need enough methods. And that's what we've done. And we played around with this line of research a little bit. Um, so we added more methods here. Uh, so we got better generalizability, but it's it's far from the 98%. And it's very, very far away. So it was very obvious that we needed an algorithmic and not just a data solution. Uh, one of the first works we've been looking at um, to do this generalizability was the forensics transfer. So essentially, we looked at future learning methods um, and how to apply them to this problem. In this case, we um, have a very nice representation learner that you, it's based on an autoencoder. And if you're doing this right, you get better transferability, right? So this is the number of images for fine tuning. This is the average accuracy um, if you're running 10 times. So with, you know, like if you're having 10 10-ish frames of the target distribution, uh, then it works pretty well. If you have one frame of the target distribution, it's already pretty bad. And if you have none of the target distribution, then it would be even worse. So it's the work here, this forensic transfer makes quite some progress, but it's far away from making it reliable in a sense, because um, you only have a, a limited set of methods available, basically. And this is a big problem. So yeah, we thought a little bit about it and we realized it's, it's not so easy because on social media, so you can expect basically to have new methods appearing all the time. And it's very difficult um, to retrain your model all the time. So this is something we had to think a little bit about. And one of the very recent methods we've been working on was ID reveal. Um, and here we thought, well, maybe we should, we should actually change the problem formulation entirely. Like maybe, maybe it's just not a good thing to ask whether a video is real or fake. Because I mean, by definition, all videos are kind of uh, fake because they have some video compression on it and so on. So we thought maybe we can we can actually change the problem setting a little bit, um, and we can rather say, is it the same person or is it a different person? So we're trying to basically classify whether it's the same identity, and we're training this on 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 the biometric features that we can learn very efficiently. And the idea is that we can do this in a only on the real video. So now if you're going ahead and saying you have n real videos, you cluster these n real videos in a self-supervised way, um, you're getting these clusters. And then if a video is not part of this cluster anymore, then you consider it to be a fake video. Right? Um, but we're doing a little bit more here. Um, we actually want to make it fairly generalizable. And the generalizability we're actually achieving by going via um, a 3D reconstruction of the face. So we're using a 3D model. Uh, so we're having a video, right? We're reconstructing a 3D, a, a 3D model here. We're having a, um, a temporal ID net. I'm going to go into all the details here, but it's, it's a neural network that considers all frames at the same time. Uh, and then we are learning a distance metric. Um, is, it this, is it from the same video? Is it from the same person or not, right? Uh, and this is done with metric learning. So the idea is um, for each face, we extract a bunch of features um, from our face tracker and from our face reconstruction. So we're getting shape, expression, and pose. Um, and this is from the model model. And then we're training this um, spatiotemporal model um, such that we're getting these feature embeddings and we're making sure that um, the same, the, the features of the same person are close and the features of different people will be um, further apart. And now, unfortunately, what you're gonna get is, so, so maybe one of the rationale here is why we're using a morphal model here is we didn't want to do it directly on the video frames. If you do this on the video frames, then you again have this problem that you're very prone to overfitting to the data sets characteristics and like the appearance and the image characteristics, right? Uh, but if I'm extracting away with this metric learner, you have uh, with the model model, you have this nice property that the metric learner operates on this abstract feature space. So you're not so prone to small lighting changes and compression artifacts and stuff like this. And this is one big plus here, uh, why this thing works a lot better. Uh, but one thing we still have to consider is we're going to have not that much training data necessarily always available. Um, and in this case, we are helping this by using adversarial training. So we use a generative network to produce features um, where similar to those that we may extract from manipulated videos. And, 
And this actually helps quite a bit. So we basically do adversarial training for these extra features. And then the objective of the adversarial game is to increase the ability of the network to distinguish real uh, from fake identities. And this works actually pretty well. So you know, in practice, it looks something like this. So we have here identity A, identity B. We have face reconstructions. We're getting the model network. This is this. Uh, um, uh, th these are these features that we're getting from the model. And then we have this temporal ID network. And then we just say here we have a temporal loss. Um, and so we have this uh, discriminative loss that says, is it real or is it fake from the respective group? And yeah, this one, um, if you're comparing it, so here are some examples um, of detection results in some of the data sets um, with different methods. And here uh, you see the accuracy, and here you see different combinations of different methods. So these, these four here are different backbone architectures, basically, that are directly supervised methods that are trained and tested on the very same data sets. Right? So we have here um, well, a smaller data set, a smaller, uh, a smaller neural network will give you only like 70%, a bigger network will give you higher accuracy, and so on. So depending on how you design your architecture, how efficiently you encode the temporal features and stuff like this, you're going to get a certain accuracy here um, on, on, on the train and test within the same domain. On the same method. Now, the challenge is when we have manipulations that are out of training, um, all of these actors here, they drop dramatically. And most of the time, they actually drop almost to 50 50. Right? So if you're looking at it, this is like 52, this is 53, 55, okay, this one is 61, um, but it, it didn't work so well in the first place. So, like, but the, the, these ones, they drop all dramatically, and it's, it's, it's all reasonable, right? Because we're training on one thing, and then we're testing on something that's slightly different in terms of distribution. So, yeah, uh, so state of the art achieved 74. Uh, we are achieving now 75, which is still not perfect, but it's a lot better. Uh, so, it's on par with state of the art, but it's a lot better than all the supervised methods. But we're actually um, obtaining even better results when, we, when, we, uh, when we're doing it with unseen compressions. So one big challenge in this defect detection thing is like all the videos are actually compressed in practice. And in that case, we can actually further improve the accuracies um, if you're considering these type of unseen compressions. Whereas the baseline methods here, they actually completely fail because they cannot, they, they, they cannot um, they cannot cope with these things, which we basically do um, with the abstraction of the 3D morphal model and with our adversarial training strategy. Uh, so these numbers are actually, these are not the very recent numbers. Actually, we, we improved this idea reveal even a bit more. Um, I would really recommend um, to have a look at the paper because it's a kind of a cool idea, right? So we basically abstracting features away with a morphal model with a with what we call a handcrafted feature, but then we're using a neural network. Um, to work on top of the features instead of overfitting to patterns uh, on the images itself, which, which for the fake detection, they turn out to be not very generalizable. Okay, um, yeah, I wanted to show, well, I have one more slide uh, for some work in progress. Um, so maybe one idea is to have active defenses against generative models, um, where we've seen a lot of talks right now about adversarial attacks. Um, one of the thought is, can you actually include, include noise patterns in, in images and videos that such that the deep fake or the, any generative models can't do anything anymore? And this is currently what we're playing around with. So here's an input image. We have some low level noise that is hardly noticeable. Um, and then we can actually disrupt the generative models quite a bit. Um, so here we're using an, an FGSM model. Um, and the objective here is to target it, um, adversarial attack where we want it to make sure that it's quote unquote as read in the output as possible. Um, so this currently work under progress. Um, the thing that we're trying to do basically is finding noise patterns that make generative models fail, but survive things like compression and so on. And, and this is kind of an interesting thing. We're looking at differential JPEG compression and these kind of things. Um, and I think that's kind of a cool future direction. Uh, unfortunately, I, would, I wish I could have talked a bit more about this part um, because it would have fitted well um, also to the previous talks. Um, but I hope um, I hope we can we can show some some updates um, in the next iteration. So yeah, um, so to the conclusion, um, I think generally speaking, looking at both sides, the synthesis and the detection is kind of cool because you know you can learn one can learn from the other, one can one one or the other can make the other one respectively better. Um, so these things inevitably go together. So this is why I'm very excited about both both things. 
And um, there's also very cool technical, interesting things you can do, like where you can use these adversarial attacks for general models and stuff like this. Um, I would also like to thank all the people who have been working on it. So these are the collaborators um, on, on, these, uh, on these papers and um, a little bit of um, advertisement. If you're interested in, in some of our CDPR works in general, um, here are our CDPR papers from our group, um, especially the dynamic neural radiance field um, uh, paper I've talked about today. Um, that is, I think, a pretty cool paper and um, I would really encourage you to have a look. So yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, Matthias, uh, thank you so much for this talk. So anyone got questions? Uh, yeah, uh, first of all, thanks for the for the talk. It's, it's a brilliant thing because uh, part of my background is a computer graphics too. So I really appreciate that uh, the talk started with uh, what graphics people did over the years, right? So I have actually a general question, a high level question regarding uh, adversarial attack because uh, it seems to me that uh, the visceral attack actually is based on the fact that it's the tag itself it should be at least imperceptive right to humans uh, otherwise it won't be adversarial anymore uh, exactly. that means actually there are in my mind there are always three different kind of uh, distributions uh, here one is the original data distribution one is actually the adversarial sample distribution one is actually the uh, imperceptive kind of a uh, adversarial samples. So those three distributions uh, in our experience are, are slightly different from each other. So one thing I think fundamental question I have here is uh, what kind of role do you think perception would play here? Because it seems that all almost all the image-based attack method, defense method actually use, for example, L norm as some sort of a surrogate perception distortion metric, right? which won't transfer well to uh, things with dynamics like videos or animation, right? So I guess my question is, uh, do you think that's something that the whole community should be looking into? Or uh, or if so, what would you think would be the best way to approach it? Thanks. No, I think it's a, it's a fantastic question, actually, right? I mean, of course, you don't want to see it. And what you, what you when you're adding adversarial um, attacks on an image, it's very different from adversarial attacks on videos because you don't have the temporal aspects. Um, the big question, I mean, it's always a bit of a, yeah, of, of a cat and mouse game, right? Like the question is, what's your manipulation method? I think all the good manipulation methods right now for, for these kind of video-based methods, they, they, they consider a temporal neural network, right? Meaning that the, the generative networks to produce the fakes they're considering multiple frames at the same time. And I think that, that of course, provides an opportunity because these networks have to be pretty powerful in order to create good videos, but that creates an opportunity for attacks that leverage actually temporal artifacts more, right? So from an attacker standpoint, we're having more, more angles for attack. So, and um, I'm, I'm thinking it not as an attack, I'm thinking of the defense against deep fakes. Um, so we have in a principle, we have more ways to prevent that a video can be deep faked um, by, by considering the whole video. That's one part. Uh, the second part of your question, I fully agree with you, like looking just in an L1 metric, like stay close to the original image or video um, is a terrible metric, right? Um, but this, <laughs> this is the same problem that we have for all kinds of generative models. Um, what's our metric for perception, right? And I, I definitely think the community has to look at this more, right? There's a few tools that we have at hand. We have things like, I don't know, we have perceptual losses, we have um, we have FFID D scores and stuff like this, right? We have a few tools that are available, but um, these tools are nowhere near the level that make these kind of things practical yet. So yeah, absolutely. I think there's a fantastic research area. I can, can only recommend to look at it in more detail. Uh, sorry, just a very quick, I don't want to dominate the, the, the conversation, but I just want to follow up with a very quick question. So. Yeah. So, see, for example, we all, a lot of people use like a, a alpha ball kind of constraints to 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 restrain uh, to or restrain a possible attacks, right? But in uh, in defenses, for example, in approaches like adversarial training, the the actually the adversarial samples used for robust training uh, are just intermediate results, so they won't be evaluated by by people, right? So, in that sense. 
uh, do you think that people could be bolder in terms of um, in terms of use of uh, adversarial samples in adversarial, adversarial training, for example, or we should also distinguish between actually uh, the real okay that's the wrong word the 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 dangerous adversarial the dangerous inceptive adversarial samples and the general adversarial samples because those two distributions are actually very different. Well, technically, you definitely have to, to to distinguish between the distributions. I mean, the question is basically what makes a network learn better, right? Um, like if you consider a defense, um, it's not always clear whether like sometimes it might make sense to use intermediate features or sorry intermediate training stages or so. Um, from the from the generative models because this might just converge better in the training phase. Um, I think it's hard to answer yet. I think the problem what we are still having is we are still struggling a little bit with defining the objective, right? Like whenever we're doing adversarial attacks, in a sense, um, we we always have this problem like, oh, what's what's the objective function, right? And the objective function mostly turns down to some L1 plus, plus a bunch of other stuff that we add in and we handcrafting that one. And, and it's not a good function that we're having there, but it's a difficult problem. I think ultimately that's the big question we have to, we have to look into. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, hi, Professor. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, a deep fake. So uh, I, I'm quite new to deep fake and uh, I've read several papers uh, it seems that uh, different uh, algorithms uh, focus on their training algorithms using different data sets. I was wondering, is there any general suggestion that which data set we should use when training a detection model? And meanwhile, is there a case that um, certain data sets are more proper for training and, while certain data sets are not? Yeah, it's a good question. Um... So the biggest challenge, of course, when detecting defects is, you, you know, it's, in a sense, it's easy. You train a binary classifier. You have a lot of data of a fake method. You can detect the fake method. The, the problem is, of course, there's a lot of different methods. So all these like detectors, they are mostly method specific, right? Train on one method, detect this one method. Um, I think what's, what's more interesting is, is you, if you're training, of course, on many methods at the same time, and then you don't have just a binary classifier, you have uh, you have an n-way classifier where um, you have n minus one fake methods and one real method. Um, so for face forensics, at least we have four fake methods. That's not great, <laughs> but it's typically three methods more than any other data set. And um, yeah, this is the big challenge, of course, right? Like how do we have enough variety of, of different fake methods in one data set? And I mean, the, the objective answer would be, well, also take now, again, like from the last year, take the newest methods again, regenerate all the fakes there, add this to the data set and so on. So I could even think about, um, yeah, I don't know, like, I mean, so face forensics is a good data set for this kind of stuff. There's, there's maybe bigger data sets like um, the one from Facebook, but they only have one fake method. They have more data, but only one fake method, right? So this is kind of the trade-off between these, between these data sets. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the, the honest answer would probably be in order to get better, we need still more method and we need still better transferability between the methods. And probably none of the method, probably none of the data sets cover all axes. This is why this is still an open research area, right? Why it still needs a lot of, um, a lot of work by the community. Yeah, I hope this helps. Yeah, thank you. I see. Uh, a quick follow up. Uh, so uh, it seems that uh, the most problem, the biggest problem right now is the general generalization problem. So uh, one method might work well on their own data set, but while tested on other data set, it fails. Um, and I've seen recently, I've seen works that they uh, like take each portion of uh, data set from each each portion of the videos from each data set and combine to make it a big training set. And then they make they do the testing and they get some good performance. But in my, in my mind, I don't really think this solves the generalization problem because you still see all data, all videos in the training set and in the testing data set. So regarding the generalization problem, do you have any like general idea or suggestions on what people should do in the yeah. following? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the obvious thing is, right, the hope is if you have, if you're training on 10 method, it, it generalizes to the 11th method. 
Th oh, this works to some degree. <laughs> it gets better, but it, it's by far no as good as if you train on this method already, right? Um, and this is the big challenge. This is why we have to look at, um, but by the way, it's a, even for humans, it's a fundamentally problematic question statement, like, because it eventually comes down to the question, what is the fake video? Like every video is fake in one way. Every video is compressed. Every video has some post-processing. Every video has some um, image enhancement probably, right? So every video is fake in a way. So the honest answer would be also to not call this real and fake detection. It would be more like, well, what kind of manipulation or features can we find in it to, to figure out what's the history that has been used to pre-process the video, right? That, that's actually the more honest answer. Um, but yeah, we have to look at generalizability methods. We have to look at domain transfer methods and we have to look at um, alternative formulations that help us to generalize the features better than just a, a naive classifier. Um, if you had asked me like four or five years ago, I thought, well, there's gonna be a few dominant methods we train on them, that's gonna be good enough, but that's not gonna be the case. We have to find better ways to do that. And by the way, this is not just a problem for, for deep fake detection. This is a problem for any arbitrary classifier too, right? Like think about the people in the self-driving car communities. They have all the problems that train them during the day um, and then testing during the night and then, then it's rainy, then it's foggy, right? Like there's like entire workshops just about these problems. Um, and it's people trying to look at it by let's throw as much data at it as we can, but eventually, right, the, the algorithmic challenges will be how can we do it to generalize better without just doing brute force augmentations. Yeah, I see. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, great. Uh, thanks again for your great talk, uh, Matisse. So we can move to the 